There we go. If you follow along with me in your bulletin, you'll know exactly where I am. You'll know exactly what scripture I'm coming to next, and you'll be ready to go. What kind of Christ would he have been? This is a question I want you to ask yourself. What kind of Christ would he have been if he had been weak and wavering, if he was unsure, uncertain of his actions, or if he had held back teaching the truth, or if he had held back doing the Father's will? What if he had been a stand-for-nothing, do-nothing person? Instead, we're thankful that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, people were in great wonder at his words that he spoke to them. Matthew chapter 7, verse 28 and 29. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. What kind of Christ would he have been if he had, would have run after the attention of the, all the religious leaders of the day? What if he had catered to their whims because he wanted their goodwill? Instead, on one occasion in Matthew chapter 15, he's talking to the Pharisees, and he says, Why do you transgress? the commandments of God because of their traditions and he called them hypocrites so in Matthew 15 and verse 12 says then his disciples came and said to him do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard these sayings what would happen today what if he had run after them apologized for his plain speaking, telling them he was so sorry that he had said this to them, saying that it'll never happen again. Instead, he made it even plainer. In verse 13, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Will be uprooted. What kind of Christ would he have been if his policy was never to be critical of any religious establishment, to approve all, to fellowship all, to get along with them, to go along with them, to extend the arm of fellowship around everything religious? Instead, he said even the more plainly, in Matthew chapter 7, began verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done all many wonders in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. Later on, he warned his disciples in Matthew 16 and verse 6, Take heed, he tells his apostles, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And do you know it didn't dawn on them right off what he was talking about? Later it dawned on them in verse 12 that he was talking to them about their doctrine. What kind of Christ would he have been if he had filled his lessons with sugar-coated expressions and never got around to pointing out error and evil and sin in the lives of us? Instead, we're thankful that he always did the will of God, that he spoke clearly and plainly so everyone could understand 
I want you to look at the seven warnings he gave in Matthew 23. Hank picked one of these this morning in our class. Matthew 23, he says to the scribes and to the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, in verse 2. And then 3 through 5, I'm going to read. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works. For they say, and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves would not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do is to be seen by men. Boy, that hits on when you watch TV. Verse 13, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. 14, woe to you scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. Verse 15, woe to you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him as much a son of hell as yourselves. Verse 16, woe to you blind guides. 23, woe to you scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. 24 and 25, blind guides who strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of of extortion and self-indulgence. Verse 27. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like a whitewashed tomb, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and uncleanliness. Verse 29. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, what kind of Christ would he have been if he would have been characterized by all of these weaknesses that I have discussed here? You're exactly right. You're exactly right. He would not have been Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Now I want you to take this a step further. I want you to think about our lives as a Christian today, our lives. Think about our lives that we live each and every day as a Christian. And I want you to look at that with an open heart and an open mind. And I want you to ask yourself sincerely, what kind of Christian would Jesus think of us? Since the creation of the world and creation of us, there's really not a dime's worth of difference. Sin then is sin today. There are only two choices that we have in this life. There are only two future choices that we have in this life. A heaven or a hell. And it's always, always been our choice to make. Around 590 B.C., on the banks of a river, Ezekiel was told by God, to speak this in divinely inspired message to God's people. And listen, it pertains as much today to us as it did those people he's talking to on the banks of that river. Yeah. Ezekiel 18 and verse 30, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from your transgressions so that iniquity will will not be your ruin. So let's carry that forward to the day. What could be the, the ruin of the Lord's church today is our toleration of evil. Sin 40 years ago, 30 years ago, is now commonplace, but it's still sin. It's not only commonplace, but it's accepted by many of us as Christians. In fact, I hate to say this, but it's even participated in. Sexual perversion. Immodesty. And on and on and on you can take this. 
and we don't blink an eye. I know some of you right out there are saying this stuff has gone on forever, and you're right. And he's talking like an old man, and I know he's right if you said that. Maybe so. But the difference is I'm talking to us as Christians, and we are to be different. We're in the world. We can't escape that. But we're not of the world. What would Christ think of us? How far have we drifted? Let me give you some examples. In the church of Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was a man who exhibited terrible behavior, sin, and it's worse. He would not repent of his sins, and the congregation that he was part of took a tolerant approach. You know, I looked at this, and maybe they thought of themselves as broad-minded. I don't know. Maybe they thought of themselves as, that's just the way the world is. Or maybe they thought of themselves that, that they ought to be tolerant. That's at that, that that is the loving thing to do. But Paul gives us a pretty good description. Paul described this congregation in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 2. And you are puffed up, he says, and have not rather mourned that he who had done this deed might be taken away from among you. Now think about that. Paul calls them puffed up. They were proud of the decision that they had arrived at. They're proud of the decision to continue to associate with this man. Paul says, instead of being proud, you know what you need to do? You need to mourn, Paul says. Like the sorrow when a, when a loved one dies. Instead of overlooking and tolerating, Paul says, hand him over to Satan. Purge him out of the church. Take the old leaven out, verse 7. Verse 13, put away from yourselves this evil person. Now I want to stop just a second. You know the only reason this was done? The only reason? It wasn't a vindictive spirit. It was Christian love. And it was done out of Christian love for one single solitary purpose. That he would repent and that he would come and return to his first love. Yeah. And in 2 Corinthians, apparently it worked. Here's the thing. What should scare us to our bones? is how strange these instructions sound to us today. Is it because of how far we've gone? What should really scare us to death is our surprise, our response, our surprise, our anger, our shock that we have such instructions. Is that how far we've gone? As Jesus drew close to a sermon on the mount, and he gave us a warning in chapter 7, it pertains as much to, to them today as it does us. Matthew 7 and verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Paul warned the Ephesian elders to be on guard for yourselves and also for the flock. Acts 20 and verse 29 through 30, Paul talking to the Ephesian elders. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among you yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Division. What saddens most of us in this building, it seems like today it's easier to find the protector of the wolves than those who will say anything 
than those who will expose. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. There are many in the Lord's church today that are not satisfied with the Lord's words, the Lord's doctrine. They have to change them and make it fit their agenda. Some are actually ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Savior of the world. They've been deceived by lies, by sweet words, to the point that we have allowed the world with denominational attitudes, now listen to me, with denominational attitudes and practices to eat its way in diseased proportions into the church of our Lord. And Satan is doing a great inside job while many of us sit idle and do nothing. In God's word, you're not left to wonder how the apostles and the early church dealt with false doctrine and teachers. Romans 16, verse 17 and 18. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, by smooth words, flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. They would watch for, and we are to watch for, they were to mark or note, and they were to avoid these people. And we are thankful for our elders. In Hebrews 13 and verse 17, they are responsible for our souls. They watch over us, and only they will give an account. We will give an account for us as individuals, but they will give an account for every one of us in here. For our souls. point is in Hebrew 13 and verse 17 is we we are to live our life so that they will watch and oversee us with joy and not grief. Have you grieved the elders? It is not good if you do. It would not be profitable for you. <laughs> Hebrew writer says so what's the point I'm trying to make? Jesus intends all of us as Christians take a stand. Stand up. Defend the truth. Never be ashamed of his gospel to never fall for their shortcuts that the world comes up with, and maybe some that are even in the church. No shortcuts. Man's ideas for salvation. To never fall for man's ideas for the organization and the doctrine of the Lord's church. But it goes deeper than this. It goes deeper than this for us. He expects us to be as individual Christians an example that we should be. To never accept evil and everything religious. That we won't be weak and wavering in the faith. I do not want this morning to hurt anybody's feelings. I promise you, that's the last thing I want to do. And I don't intend to do it. I'm talking to myself as well. Boy, I'll tell you one thing about my preaching years and years now is I always had the proper example 
myself. I always looked at myself. I never run out of material. And I'm saying this to myself as well. There are many of us in here that are not faithful in our attendance. I know 100 brothers and sisters that are here that already have planned not to be back tonight. That already have planned not to be back Wednesday. That already have determined months and years ago that they're not coming to Bible class. I was one of those person, people one time. You know what causes that? I believe this. That we've been convinced by the world. The world has a hold of us. That that's all that's required. And nothing else is required. I'm saying this out of Christian love. This is our responsibility to God. And we can't put it aside. It's on us. Sunday is the Lord's day, all day. We're told in Hebrews 10 and verse 25 not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a matter of some. Are we the some? Are we? This wasn't a suggestion, it wasn't just a code that we would try to live by. This is His commandment. I didn't say it. He said it. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 13, and 14, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate. Difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few that find it. And that's scary. Few that find it. There is not one person in this auditorium, not one, that wants to take the wide gate and the broad way. None of us wants to try to take our excuses that we have for not being a faithful Christian in our life in all areas. We don't want to take those excuses to the judgment and face the Lord and try to convince Him of why our excuse was so good. Not one of us in this auditorium wants to hear the chilling words of the Lord, Depart from me, I never knew you. What kind of Christian would we be if our life as a Christian were characterized by all these weaknesses? You know something? I'm going to leave that to you. I'm going to leave that for you to answer. Because I struggle with the answer for myself. That's an answer you're going to have to decide. All of us as Christians want a home in heaven to live our lives the best we can to please God, to be faithful to the best of our ability. All our hope rests on all his promises. We want to hear him say to us, well done, you good and faithful servant. That's what we pray to hear. Now I want you to listen a second. If you're here and you're not a Christian, and here's what I mean by that. I want you to listen for the next few minutes. If you have never believed in him, repented of your sins, confessed that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, and been baptized for the remission of your sins, if you hadn't done that, and if you die, or the Lord comes back tomorrow, there is no hope for you for heaven, I don't know how else to say this. Are you filled with so many excuses? Well, I used to have them. I'm just not good enough. I heard one man say, I'm just too old. 
He's my dad's best friend. I heard him say that forever. I'm just too old. I know I need to, and I will. I'll get around to it. I just need more time. How many of you said that? And usually what happens is we take those excuses that we have to the grave and face the Lord. Jesus plainly told his apostles, plainly, Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. He only gave two options. Believe and be saved. Don't believe and be baptized. And don't believe and be condemned. That's it. And this is exactly, listen to me, this is exactly what was preached in the first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost. If you haven't done this, I want you to listen some more. The first gospel sermon was preached and the people heard, they believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And these believers knew that they weren't, there's something else to do. And so they asked the question in Acts 2, 37, what shall we do? And they were given the exact answer, plain and sure. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There wasn't no arguing. There wasn't no shortcuts. There wasn't no divisions. No arguing. 3,000 were baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins, and they were automatically added to his church in verse 41. If you're not a Christian, listen. Baptism is the point where we make contact with his blood. We die to our old self. We're raised up out of the watery grave, a new person in Christ, to live faithful to him. We're in Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27, For you are all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's how we do it. There's one sure way to be saved. Any other way, any other way is man's speculation. If you are a Christian, are you a faithful soldier of the cross? Are you just playing the game? Are you filled with excuses and you're willing to take these excuses with you to the judgment and try to convince the Lord why you couldn't do his will? Has the world convinced you that you can't fall from grace? That it's impossible to fall away. That's what the world wants you to believe. They have con convinced you that you don't have to bear fruit. You will not be cut off. Satan convinced. Use those same words, Adam and Eve. If you do not bear fruit, you will be cut off. Are you the Christian that God expects? Are you the Christian you expect? If your answer is, no, I'm not, you need to make it right. You need to repent and come back to him before it's too late. Won't you come while we're standing?